on to uh, the most important part of the webinar, of course, um, welcoming our speaker for, uh, for today, Dr. Isabella Mandel, who is a Bat Conservation International Post Postdoctoral Fellow based at the University of Vienna in Austria. And together with local partners, she has been working on the ecology and conservation of the rare Livingstone's fruit bat in Comoros since 2019. And today she will be talking to us uh, about her work following the fruit bats. So thank you very much for joining us today, Bella, and over to you. Thank you, Elisa. Let me just, uh, oh, I can't share my screen as long as you're still sharing. Wait, all right, we're on. There we go. That works, does it? That works now with some presentation mode. So yeah, we can Perfect. see it. Great. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm really pleased to be here today and to kind of be able to talk about something I've been working on for a few years now. And that's slowly and finally coming to an end. So I'm rather excited to see um, where this project has ended up now. So I'll be just quickly introducing myself as well. Um, I wear a bunch of different hats at the moment. So I, I'm a postdoc at the University of Vienna, working with Bat Conservation International. I also volunteer for Bats Without Borders. And I'm currently an active mentor for students from Madagascar and for, from Kenya. So I kind of try to do um, a lot of different things that interest me. And more recently, for the past five, six years, that's been bats for sure. I moved to the, I actually moved to the Comoros in 2018, um, directly after my PhD, when I got offered a job at the NGO Dahari there. And before I, I moved there, I actually had to Google where it was because I wasn't entirely sure where it was. And um, it is a small group of islands just west of, of Madagascar. So it's located in the Indian Ocean in the Mozambique Channel. And the Union of Comores is a group of three islands, um, but the whole archipelago is, um, consists of four islands. But the fourth island, Mayotte, still belongs to France. So the Comores used to be a French colony, uh, they, and they gained independence around the 70s, I think 74 it was. So today we're just going to be talking mainly about these two islands, Anjouan and Mohili. Those islands are the ones where the Livingston's flying fox is endemic to. You cannot find them anywhere else. So those are the islands where my work has brought me the most. And as you might be able to tell from the graphic, the islands themselves are very hilly. They're very mountainous. Um, they're true volcanic islands. So they've been created through volcanic outbursts. And if you look closely, you can actually still see a whole lot of craters around the islands and the uh, elevations are quite high. So it goes from sea level to around 1500 meters above sea level very, very quickly because Anjan, for example, the whole island here is about only 20, square kilo uh, 20 kilometers across. So as you can imagine, as soon as you land on the island, you're confronted with mountains. The Comoros has a quite a few species of bats on them, including three different fruit bats. So the Livingston's fruit bat is not the only fruit bat you can find there. The most widespread one is actually the Seychelles flying fox. And the Seychelles flying fox you can find on all of these islands. Um, as the name, name says, it's originally from the Seychelles, so it's not endemic to Comoros. It's a large flying fox, so it has around 500, 600 grams. Um, and it seems to be quite happy feeding of fruit trees that we find there, things like mangoes, lychees, jackfruits, that sort of thing. And it seems to be, I don't want to say thriving, but doing quite well on the Comoros. And then you have the other two fruit bat species that are actually endemic to the Comoros, which is for one, the Comora rosette. And that is a very small fruit bat. It's about a handful. Uh, and they feed on fruit, as the name says, but also a lot on nectar and uh, pollen as well. And they are quite widespread as well, but they are vulnerable on the IUCN red list because their habitat is vanishing. And that habitat includes, for example, caves. So the bats themselves, they are you can find them on all the islands, but they're not as common as they could be. And then, of course, there's the Livingston's fruit bat, the species that I've been working with for the past five years. 
And this fruit bat is uh, the largest of the three. So they're around 700 grams. They're quite a uh, chunky bat to hold on the hand. They're very gentle compared to the others, whereas the flying the Seychelles flying foxes are quite vicious. Um, Livingston's fruit bats are very gentle. And they only occur on Moheli and on Anjouan, with the bigger population actually being on the island of Anjouan. So my work has been mainly focused on Anjouan. And I'd like to paint a little picture of the Comores for you. So as you can imagine, it's not that easy to get there. You can fly into Grand Comor um, with international flights, but then you have to get onto tiny rickety planes from probably the 80s that then bring you to Anjouan and Moheli. The flights are very short. It's around 20 minutes to get there. Um, there's an alternative. You can take the boat, but that takes about a day and it's not necessarily much safer. So it's... It's it's an adventure to get there even. And you like I mentioned before, you're very quickly confronted just with how hilly the whole landscape is. The Comores is one of the most densely populated um, areas in the world. Not necessarily because there's humans everywhere, but because there's humans everywhere, there can be humans. So you have a lot, a lot, a lot of um, settlements and villages with high population density, especially on Anjouan. And the majority or the entire um, Union of Comores is actually mainly Muslim. So it's a very Muslim country. Um, I don't have a lot of pictures of people, mainly because it's considered rude to take pictures, photos of people, especially if you don't ask them. So basically, all you can see here is pictures of my colleagues while we were enjoying lunch on um, next to the office building where we work. But the... The people themselves, they're very Muslim, they're incredibly friendly, um, they're very, very open, and the island is incredibly safe. So Anjouan is very safe to live and to travel. If you disregard political instabilities and um, power grabs by politicians, if you look at it from a societal level, um, it's very, very safe to be there. However, it's also incredibly poverty-stricken. So around 50% of... Um, all Comorian people live under the, under the poverty line, or something which we'll come back to a bit later. So you can get, get incredibly rich people that have been able to make a lot of money, and you get a lot, a lot of poor people as well across the islands. This is a very, very typical picture of what Anjouan looks like. On the first glance, you think, oh, this is beautiful, this is green, this is forest everywhere, it must be such a paradise. Um, but you have to look a bit closer. And as soon as you start looking at what you're actually seeing there, it becomes very clear that the island is not in a great shape. For example, most of the plants you can see in this picture have been introduced on this island. So they're not native plants, they're not naturally grown. And the natural habitat on the Comoros Islands should be high altitude rainforest. So it should be rainforest that you can find up in the mountains. Sometimes we call it cloud forest as well. Um, and there is none of this here on this picture, actually. If you look right in front, the spiky plants, those are sea salt plants that were planted by um, French colonializers for to be able to kind of uh, export sea salt from the, from the Comoros. You can make twine and rope and fibers out of it. The next level of plants, the light green one there, those are banana plants. They've been planted by the population for food. Then you have these bubbly looking trees everywhere. Those are actually clove trees. They're spice cloves. The Comores is the second largest producer or even the largest producer of cloves in the world. So that's one of the few things that can actually, um, that are actually being exported from the Comores are cloves. And then in between those, you find coconut palms. Again, those are not naturally grown. And if you look a little bit onto the hills, there's not a lot of tree vegetation there, actually. It's very sparse. Everything that's kind of accessible has been either cut down or replaced by this non-native vegetation. And that's a picture that you can find throughout the islands. This is what natural forest should look like on the Comoros. This is actually a picture from a uh, national park in Moheli, where you can see that these there's lots of really big, not as really big, like fat trees, but like spindly trees. Um, and that is the most natural forest can be here um, on the Comoros. And even here, you can see right in front, you've got a whole lot of banana plants that were planted there by people who obviously use the bananas for um, food and selling. 
So even in the more natural areas on the Comoros Islands, you will find signs of either human use or um, invasive plants that have managed to invade the, the last forest fragments there are. I don't know if I mentioned this, but Anjouan is very hilly. <laughs> It's just hills, hills, hills. The terrain is very difficult. It's very steep. Um, most of the time you don't even see the, the hills because there's just clouds hanging over them. Like I said before, it's a cloud. The natural habitat is a cloud forest and this might be able to show you a little bit why. So it's incredibly humid and it's difficult to hike around on the islands. I, I do it because I have to, but if I had the choice, it wouldn't be my preferred hike to be hiking uphill all the time. So the islands, like I said, are very green. Um, most of this vegetation, however, is not native. So there's a big question on how the animals survive on, this isle on these islands. And the Comoros have, don't have the highest biodiversity level, so you don't have a lot of different species there, but you have quite a few endemic species, so species that you can only find on the Comoros and nowhere else. Um, in terms of mammals, however, because they're tiny islands, the only native mammal you can actually find on Comoros is a bat, and the bats are the only native mammals. Everything else has been introduced by humans, um, things like rodents or um, civets are there as well. And another thing that's been introduced on the Comoros are the lemurs. So Le Madagascar is normally the only country where you can find lemurs um, in the natural habitat. However, humans have brought lemurs over to the Comoros hundreds of years ago as pets, and they have since established quite a stable population there. And the lemurs, very much like the Seychelles flying foxes, seem to be working well with the wet vegetation they can find there. So they seem to live off these introduced fruit trees. They live off the mango trees, the banana trees, of the spice trees even. So they, they're doing quite well. And it's only this one species. So it's only the mongoose lemur that you can find there. But if you're out in the forest, you will see a group of mongoose lemurs for sure. So that's kind of the baseline situation on the Comoros. However, there is, of course, a bit of a complicated side to um, the combination of having a very limited space, being a small island, having a lot of people on it, and having the need to uh, feed yourself and your family. So basically, com this really high rate of poverty, combined with a lack of opportunities to get income, means that people are relying on agriculture to feed themselves and their families. And because there's a lot of people and because you have big families, you need a lot of space for agriculture. And on Anjuan, at least, most of the land that's accessible has been converted into some sort of crop land. So most of the landscape, if you look closer, actually looks like this photo. You'll see there's um, fields, there's newly plowed fields, there's some banana plantations around as well. And then you have these large trees that have been left standing in the landscape. And those trees um, can either be introduced fruit trees, but very often they're actually still original rainforest tr trees that have just been left standing there to kind of mark where the fields start or end. So even though you don't have a rainforest anymore, you might still have these rainforest native trees standing there. And that, that's important later on as for the bats as well. But yeah, so most of the countryside actually looks like this. Here's another example. You have some trees left over in the countryside and around them is basically just a sweet potato field or taro field. And the undergrowth has been removed. The tr most of the trees have been removed. And that's sort of a very widespread problem is that people start removing undergrowth and small trees first and start planting, um, but leaving these large trees standing and the more and more space they need for planting, the more and more they will cut down these large trees until there's only these individual trees left standing in the landscape. Agriculture is one of the main drivers for um, the forest lost on, on the Comores. Excuse me. However, it is there's still some forest left in the areas that are inaccessible. So you still find, um, I'm going to say, untouched forest fragments um, with quotation marks across the island. However, you also have some urban development happening and you have uh, some like street building happening. This is a road they cut 
essentially through the island, through the middle of Anjouan, where they literally cut through the vegetation, through the habitat, um, to combine the east and the west of, of the island. And that opened up a lot of the previously inaccessible areas for actually exploitation. So now people, even they might not use the road to travel from A to B, but they use the road to get to places that they hadn't been able to get to before. Um, and they now go into spots that might have not been accessible before, cut down the trees there and start agriculture there. So it's it's making it's making the island more accessible. That is also kind of a problem here. So the forest loss is widespread, and it's again, it's not just the agriculture, and there's a lot of complex um, drivers that happen to be in place. So it's not an easily resolved problem. Uh, but the second aspect of this forest loss is also that just cutting down trees and selling the wood for timber is uh, a very quick way of making cash. So in a country where you don't have a lot of opportunities to have income, if you have large trees on your on your field or on your land, you are able to cut those down, down and sell the, sell the wood. And it's going to be used for furniture, for construction, to make boats out of. And there's very specific woods that are preferred for specific purposes, but most of them are native rainforest trees. So these introduced fast growing trees like eucalyptus and mango, they aren't really used for this purpose. It's the, the more precious woods here that are being targeted. So one side, you need to have a field or a cropland to feed yourself and your family. On the other hand, you can also use these trees to get cash fast if you don't have another way of um, generating income. And the third aspect of the habitat loss or the forest loss on um, the Comoros is actually <coughs> excuse me, the production of ilang-ilang. So ilang-ilang, you might not have heard of before, you might not have seen it before necessarily, but I guarantee you, you've smelt it before because the oil of this flower is actually present in so many bath products and so many really high-end perfumes that you can get here in Europe. And this is what the trees look like. They're being kept artificially small, so it's easier to harvest the flowers directly by the hand. And that means they require a lot of space. So there's quite um, a few areas where there's ilang ilang plantations, where forest has been cleared or areas have been cleared to plant these ilang ilang trees. And similar to the cloves, Comoros is actually one of the biggest exporters of ilang ilang oil in the world as well. So you have the agriculture, you have the forest loss, and then you have the clearance for ilang ilang plantations. And then we have another issue is that you can't just export ilang flowers directly, you have to distill them pretty quickly after harvesting, and then you can export or sell the oil. And this is a typical distillery that you can find next to the road on Anjuan. It looks very makeshift in my judgment it is very makeshift because it's run on on fire and for the to feed the fire you need fuel wood so trees are actually being cut down to feed the fuel um, as fuel wood for the fires for the distilleries um, to distill ilang flowers to produce the oil which can then be exported so there's another aspect that comes into this why forest is being cut down in in Anjuan but this wood here, at least, is not targeting the rainforest trees. It's actually targeting these fast-growing introduced trees. But even there, not many people discriminate too much. And it's quite easy that um, you know cheaper woods, if they're rainforest trees, can also be cut down and burned to create ilang ilang oil. So you've got this. I hope I painted a picture that's not too bleak. However, it's also not a very rosy picture at this point, because you have a lot of different factors that influence the deforestation on Anjuan. And one of the big questions now is how do the, the bats even survive in the landscape? So the Seychelles flying foxes, as I mentioned before, they seem to be doing fairly well because they can use um, areas that are not forest. They actually, there's a lot of them in the cities. There's a lot of them in agricultural land and they seem to be quite stable there. But the, for the Livingston's fruit bat, the endemic large fruit bat of the Comoros, we're not sure how they're surviving there because they're supposed to be a rainforest habitat species. They're supposed to be depending on rainforest habitat and there's not much left of that. We know that they eat fruit, but we're not entirely sure what kind of fruit they eat. And we know their approximate population size. So we know there's around 1300 individuals, give or take maybe a hundred. So the population is quite small um, it's been stable for a few years now, but it's quite small and there's a very, very high risk that they can go extinct very quickly. For example, if you have 
a devastating weather um, event like a cyclone that comes in and erases the rest of the landscape, it could wipe out the entire species at this point. So we know that there are bats, we know how many there are, and we know about approximately where their roosts are. So we know there's about 15 to 20 roosts on the island of Anjuan. And those roosts um, are mainly these old native rainforest trees. So you have these old, large, spindly trees in the landscape that the bats will use, and you'll find maybe one to 20 bats in a tree. They don't really roost in huge groups like other flying foxes. They stay in smaller groups or in pairs. Uh, and they're quite easy to spot because these trees are often the last trees left standing in the area because many of them have been left standing in these agricultural fields. So we know where the roosts are, and we also know what the threats are. One of the major threats is that habitat loss, is the fact that the forest is being lost, um, but also that these important trees are being targeted because these old native rainforest trees are being cut down for timber, are being maybe cut down for um, fuel wood, and the, the bats definitely need them as roost sites. There's also no enforced protection. So the species is formally protected by the government. Um, it's internationally protected as well by um, CITES, but it's not. there's no enforced protection for the species. There's nobody that goes out and tells people not to cut down the trees that the bats need. And one of the big things is we don't really know about their ecology and behavior. So there's been studies that have been done in the past, but because up to now it wasn't really um, a, it wasn't really possible to tag them and see where they're going. We don't really know what they do in the landscape. And this is where I come in. So this lack of knowledge on ecology and behavior has been hindering effective conservation actions to this point. So we can protect the roost sites and the roost sites are important, but as long as we don't really know what other important resources they need in the landscape or where they go in the landscape, what they're using in the landscape, and when are they using these things? We can't really target conservation action to um, include more than just the roosts. So at this point, we know where they roost, but we don't know, for example, where they feed. We don't know where they go in different seasons. There's a very distinct dry season, a very distinct wet season on the Comoros, and flying foxes have shown to be very seasonal. So they'll follow fruit and um, other resources across the landscape. And that's kind of what we suspect is happening here, but we don't really know for sure. And my project for the last four or five years has been to try and find out what these bats are doing, where in the landscape, and when are they doing it. And we're doing this together, so Bat Conservation International and um, the local NGO, the Hari, we're both working on this together to try and find out. And if you want to study the bats in any capacity on the Comoros, you have to walk uphill. You have to go uphill on Anjouan, because most of the roosts are actually above 600 meters of sea, sea level, some of them are up to 900 meters. So you have to walk for hours uphill. And many of the times we stay in the, um, in the field sites close to the roosts or maybe one or two feeding trees that we know and we camp there, but we can't really stay there for longer than a couple of nights because there is a lack of water across the island. So because this landscape has just been so degraded over time, um, out of the 40 permanent rivers, most of them have dried up of, or become seasonal. So sometimes you just can't find fresh water in the field and you have to either carry enough water for you to, to stay up there for a longer time or you just have to go back down um, after a couple of days and restock on water. And this is usually what we do. We go up there, we stay up there for two nights and then we go back down to the villages, um, regroup, restock on water and go back up the next week or so. And then we catch the bats. And this is easier said than done. And I often get asked um, how we catch the bats. And this is basically, you have to use nets to catch bats. And you have to use quite large nets to catch these large bats. And um, that is always a logistical issue because managing these large nets, we, one, we had one that was 30 meters in length once, is a bit of a hassle. And then you have to put them really, really high up. Um, and with really high, I mean, you have to put them on canopy level or above canopy level. So that means you have to find people who can climb trees, um, who are willing to, to climb these trees, who are willing to fix the nets up there. 
Sometimes we go a bit further and we use bamboo that we can find in the landscape. We fix the nets on the bamboo and then we actually tape the bamboo with a whole lot of duct tape into the canopy of the tree. As you can see in the, the right picture there, there's this stick sticking out of the tree. This is actually a bamboo pole. And then up on top of that, um, you have the nets hanging from some, uh, I don't, I want to say string, it's rope, from some rope. So the net will be up around 10, 15 meters above us and it'll be there. And then all we can do is actually wait and hope that a bat flies in there. But because we have to put these nets up during the daytime, it's far too dangerous to climb these trees at night. Um, the bats see the net. And then basically this is what happens most of the time is just that we're standing beneath the net and the bats will come and circle it, have a look at what it is, and then they fly off. So this has been a lot of my last year has been standing underneath bats and watching them avoid the nets. However, we managed to catch quite a few in the end. So we found some spots that work well and we ended up catching um, 17 bats last year, which for me is a lot. I know it doesn't sound a lot, but the effort we have to put in to catch even one of these bats, I'm more than happy with 17. And then once we catch them, uh, we try and sex them. So we find out if it's male and female, we weigh them and we measure them. And these bats, like I said, have around 700 grams and the wingspan of up to four feet. So they can, they're quite large, they're quite hefty. Thankfully, they're quite gentle and calm once you have them in the hand. And the reason why we do this is so we can put GPS trackers on them. And this is the heart of my research is actually we are tracking these bats across the landscape to try and answer some of the questions I mentioned before. And these GPS trackers, um, they weigh about around 15 grams. They're on a, we put them on collars, so I made them some nice little fancy collars. And so they have these GPS tracker collars around their necks and the trackers themselves have solar panels on the back so they can recharge. And they start taking um, GPS points immediately for up to six months so far. And the collars should fall off after a certain amount of time. So they've been made with a weak link, so they don't stay on forever, they actually fall off. And then if we're lucky, we get to retrieve the collar and the GPS tracker um, as well. So there's a bunch of them that have fallen off already, but we haven't been able to get to them because the landscape is too complicated to actually get everywhere. However, we have 17 bats with trackers um, and we got, last year, we got quite a lot of data from them. So we really know where the bat bats have been going, what times of the year. So this is, again, the research has been done mainly on Anjuan. Um, so we tracked only bats in Anjuan. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit about the res of the results there. It's a very uh, basic map of the island with some land cover indications that was made a couple of years ago. So this is the most recent land cover map you can find. The lighter it is, the more trees there are. And in the very center of the island, you can actually see these white spots. Those are the remaining actual forest spots that you can find on Anjuan. And it's around 46 square kilometers, I think. So around a tenth of the island is still considered to have forest in it. The east of the island is mainly agricultural fields and the west, there's a lot of trees there. Um, there's a lot of agroforest there. So it's not necessarily forest, but there's a lot of trees that are being used by humans. A lot of the clove trees, a lot of the mango trees, um, citrus trees, those are basically uh, part of the landscape here, but it's not natural forest. So we really wanted to know where do the bats go in this landscape? Do they actually use the natural forests only or do they use other areas as well? And this is the data of all these 17 bats mixed together. It got very messy when I tried to pull it apart, but you can already see that there are some clumps of where there's lots and lots of tracks, where there were lots and lots of GPS points, where the bats spent lots and lots of time um, in. And there's three major clumps here, and all these three are surrounding one of the catching sites. So the bats that we caught basically stayed in their areas for most of the data collection period. They did switch roosts quite a few times, but they didn't go very far. And I was already, I was, I was very surprised because these are big bats, they have big wings. Flying foxes are known to fly for tens and nearly maybe hundreds of kilometers. Um, why are these bats staying in very small areas? And then the seasons changed and then the dry season ended, the rainy season started, and suddenly you can see these tracks that lead across the island. 
suddenly you find bats that are actually flying somewhere else and looking for resources. And it seems to be very seasonal how these bats use um, the landscape, at least. So this is very new data. I only got this in, in January this year. So it's, it's very fresh and new. And I didn't have time to think about it in too much detail, but I'm very excited about it. And what we're actually interested in Okay, this might look a bit complex, but I'm trying to walk you through it. What we're interested in is to see how they use the landscape. So the lighter areas in this insert in this picture are actually forest fragments. Those are areas that we can be certain there's a at least a little bit of forest left. And these blue dots, these blue clusters are areas that the bats visited, they went to multiple times or they stayed there for a long time. And you can see, if you look closely, those clusters are mainly in areas where there's forest. So even these small clusters here, you can see that those are located in these forest areas and that this dark gray in between, which is agricultural land, is basically not used by the bats. And they don't even seem to prefer flying across that land, but they seem to prefer flying along these forested bits as well. And this is the sort of, <clears throat> sorry, crucial information for us because we wanted to know, you know, do these bats need the forest to survive? And this first indication is they definitely do because they look at, they look up and search for trees that are located in these forest fragments. However, you do have a couple of trees that are in agricultural landscape. And those were the ones we're really interested in because I was wondering what are bats doing on sweet potato fields? Why, why are they flying there? There's nothing there for them. And it turns out this is the sort of thing that we find there is you actually do have a field with no nothing going on. And then you have this big tree in the middle, which ends up being a really important resource for the bats. And in this case, this is a kapok tree. So it's an introduced fruit. Uh, it's an introduced tree that is um, mainly visited when it's flowering. So the bats really love the kapok flowers. And it's an important resource for them. So many, many, many bats, dozens of bats are there every night to eat those kapok flowers. So even though they might not necessarily um, be in a forest, the trees themselves are still being used, the ones that are being considered important resources for the bats. And that was kind of um, a big aha moment for me, at least, because the bat is always, it's always said to be a forest species. So I, I was under the impression it could only use a forested area, but they seem to be okay using non-forested areas if the right trees are still there. So it might not be necessarily that the forest is the most important thing, but that the trees are the most important thing that the bats are actually targeting. So what we're doing as well, besides collecting this GPS data from the bats, we're also going and um, surveying all the trees that we can get to that the bats have visited. So if you remember these blue clusters from before, those are areas where the bats hang out a lot and they go back to, and we go into those areas as well, as far as possible, and then um, take surveys of all the trees that are there that the bats have been visiting. And up to this day, we have managed to survey around 150 trees. This is, again, this is quite new. So we've only started end of last year. And we're going to continue throughout this year and next year as well to survey all the trees that we know the bats have definitely go gone to. And what was interesting for us was that about three quarters of those trees were native rainforest tree species. So this is important because other bats very much use the introduced trees, like the, the kapok trees I mentioned, but there's also mango trees. There are um, badamye trees, there are jackfruit trees, breadfruit trees. Those are all trees that we know, for example, the Seychelles flying fox lives off. They, they eat them all the time. They've been using them all the time. And from initial observations, we were already quite wondering why there were no flying foxes on these trees, because those trees are everywhere. You can find breadfruit trees everywhere across the landscape. And there's flying foxes, Seychelles flying foxes on them, but the Livingston's fruit bats weren't visiting them. And it looks like from what we can find so far is that they're actually targeting the rainforest trees. They're preferring those, uh, preferring is a strong word, but they seem to be visiting those more than the introduced fruit trees. So this is, I think this is a crucial point to consider for the conservation of the species. And the other thing that we found is that most of the trees that we've surveyed so far have actually been in this agroforested landscape. So in the landscape where there are lots of trees, the bats will 
seek out the native trees, the rainforest trees, and visit those. And a few of them were even in agricultural landscape. Not a lot of the trees that we found so far were in the actual forest, but the issue with this is that most of the forest is in inaccessible areas. So we can't really survey all the forest trees that we know the bats go to. And this is something that I have to deal with with the data analysis in the future. But just I wanted to just let you know so you don't think <gasps> they never go to forest. That's not true. They visit the forest um, a lot of the times, but we might not be able to get there to actually survey the trees. So where does that leave us? Um, this is basically one year of data that I've presented to you right now. There's, this year is still ongoing. I'm going back to the Comoros in May. So the data collection will continue. We're trying to finalize it by the end of the year, maybe early next year. And then we're going to go on to the next stage and use the data and the results for applied conservation. So the questions I mentioned before, the what are the bats doing, where are they doing it, and when are they doing it, um, those are the questions we hope to answer and those are the questions we hope to help the Hari um, with developing a conservation strategy for the bats. So it's a bit more targeted, that's not just the roost sites, but also areas that the bats visit for feeding and socializing. A little bit about Dahari. Dahari is a local conservation NGO on the Comoros. Um, it's been around for 10 years. They just celebrated the 10 year anniversary. They have more than just bat conservation. They actually have a huge marine conservation sector where they help um, local fisheries produce enough to be able to sell, to kind of gain income with it. They pr while produce, uh, protecting the, the coral reefs. They've spent 10 years monitoring the biodiversity and the natural resources of Anjuan. Um, they also work very intensely in protecting and conserving natural resources, such as water reservoirs and trees, of course, in the forest. A large part of the Hari is working on sustainable agriculture. So they work together with communities to find sustainable ways of using the landscape so that not more areas have to be cleared for agriculture. They're trying to find and develop ways that the, the crops yield more so people can actually get, get more out of their fields, ways for water irrigation, for example. So there's a lot of a lot of community work that's going on. And of course, they work with reforestation. They've been setting up tree nurseries all around the islands, um, but not just the forest trees, but also of trees that can be used in agriculture in an attempt to kind of boost the output of individual landholders' fields as well. For the bats, they have been actively trying to protect the bat roosts since 2015, where they've started out a scheme of conservation agreements, which means that because of the way um, land ownership is structured in Anjuan, basically every single one of the bat roosts is on private land. So it's, it's on land that's being used or used to be used. And the Hari set up agreements with those landowners that they would agree to not fell the trees to regenerate the habitat, to basically plant and reforest the areas around the roosts. In exchange for incentives like payments when we go to visit the roosts for research purposes or agricultural support, agricultural support um, where the farmers themselves get trainings in the sustainable agriculture, they get support to um, make sure that their lands uh, have better and more um, yield, yield more crops. And they also get plants, crop plants that they want to use on their other lands, so not on the land around the roost trees. And this sort of scheme is something that the Hari now wants to expand to areas that are important for the bats, um, not just the roost sites. And we found out because the bats use a lot of the agroforestry areas as well, where there is a lot of human activities, we are now trying to think about developing maybe bat-friendly agroforestry areas. So areas that are semi-natural, but they still yield something for the landholders. So they have they generate income for the landholders while not disturbing the bats or even promoting um, a healthy bat habitat. So a good example for this is, for example, in Madagascar, there's lots of vanilla and cocoa plantations that are semi-natural, where there's lots of high biodiversity because the natural fauna can use the, the areas but the landholders can still use it to um, grow vanilla or grow cocoa and generate some income. So that's the sort of idea that we're walking down at this lane now to kind of figure out how we can promote sustainable agriculture and a healthy bat habitat at the same time. 
at this point, we are currently conducting stakeholder interviews and doing landscape assessments and just setting up this scheme. So this is going to take a few years to roll out, but it's well on the way to be able to kind of be launched in a couple of years time where also my data collection will be finished. And we have a really good idea of which areas we actually need to protect, which landholders we need to target and need to include in this. And the hope is, of course, that the bats will act as an umbrella species, meaning that if we regenerate and restore the habitat for the bats, we're actually um, helping the natural biodiversity regenerate as well. So the bats can kind of act as a protective umbrella for the local birds, the butterflies, the reptiles and the plants. And so with that, I mean, I'm very hopeful that this is going to work. It's I think we're on a really, really good path. It's been very thought out. So just to say goodbye, there's a picture of the last bat we caught or a video of the last bat we caught last year. We put the last GPS tracker on in September, and this is us releasing him in the early morning hours. They are quite slow, but this is slow motion. So this is a very, very successful night and I still look at this video and I'm still really pleased with how how that catcher trip trip went. And how um, I'm very optimistic about this whole project and how it's going to end. That being said, I am very privileged that I'm able to talk about this and I'm able to present what we're doing, but I'm obviously not the only one doing the work, so this is built on the shoulders of a huge team of people, especially Bajan and Ishaka, who have been just working hard and tirelessly to collect data, even when I'm not in the field. They're out right now serving trees. You've got Imran, who's doing a um, bachelor's degree, an undergrad degree with us and learning more about trees. Nadia as well was such a rock helping up setting the whole project up. And my colleagues from Mauritius who came and initially helped me with setting up how to most effectively catch these bats and suffering with me in the cold while the bats were just flying away. Um, I'm very, very grateful for all of these people without whom this project would not exist and wouldn't be in this great state as it is, as it is today. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I think we have time for questions. I haven't timed myself. We have a bit of time for questions and I hope you enjoyed this little insight into um, Comoros and the fruit bats there. Thank you. That was great, Bella. Thank you very much for that. Um, really enjoyed it. Amazing work that you have done. Um, really hard field work by the looks of it, uh, but a really impressive data and with a really strong uh, applied component to it in terms of conservation. So thank you very much for telling us that story. Um, we do have um, time for questions and mm -hmm. several questions in the chat. Uh, let me just go back to them. Uh, do you, the first question from Will, um, do you think bats move between Moheli and, and Juan? That is one of the things. Um, first of all, I get that question asked a lot, and it's such a good question because the distance between the two islands at the closest point is just over 30 kilometers. So they can definitely, they could cross it. There was a recent genetic study that said it doesn't seem like the two populations mix genetically. And when we went there after a cyclone, so after a cyclone, about a third of the population of Anjuan vanished. And we were kind of wondering if they had left the island and gone to Mohili where the cyclone hadn't been so bad. But when we went to Mohili, there was even less bats there. So there was no in immediate indication that bats from Anjuan leave and go to Mohili. That being said, we found out they're very good at hiding in the vegetation. So they might be traveling between the islands and we just haven't found them yet. But in my data, it hasn't been shown from the GPS tracks, but those were 17 bats. So I'm not gonna say it's it's not happening, but I haven't seen it happen yet. Okay. Great, um, thanks for that. We have another question um, from uh, Abby Jack asking how can we learn about bats without catching them um so yeah i don't know if this is specifically about fruit bats um presumably fruit bats are hard because they don't echolocate um, most of them don't echolocate so you can't really learn about their activities with bioacoustics 
you can't really observe them most of the time because they're very nocturnal. The flying foxes, the living since fruit bats, they're very, they are very diurnal. So they're active during the day a lot. But in many other areas in Southeast Asia, for example, they, they're not active during the day. So it's hard to learn a lot of details about the bats without catching them in the wild. That being said, you can, there are some captive populations of flying foxes that you can kind of help you get an indication of what might happen in the wild. But we're trying, obviously, we're trying to kind of minimize all the most more invasive things as we go on. But there are just some things I think we wouldn't be able to know if we hadn't GPS tracked them. Like we, there's some areas they go to, we would never go to to look for them. Great. There's a follow up question to that asking um, about the trees. Uh, what, what trees do fruit bats like to make the roosts in? The Livingston fruit bats, they use mainly the native rainforest trees, but not own, not exclusively. So they do have a few trees that have been introduced. Um, they seem to be preferring specific locations and specific sizes of trees, not necessarily specific species of trees. Um, next question we have um, uh, is more of a comment, I think, from Will uh, about bats not necessarily only liking native fruit bats. Um, so yeah, the kind of need to protect um, other tree species as well uh, that the bats are using. For sure. I mean, we see that with these bats as well, but I was expecting them to use non-native trees more than they have been so far. I've been really expecting them to just go for the breadfruit and the badamye and more. But the kapok is very seasonal. We know they go for that. And we have found them on eucalyptus trees as well. So I was I was honestly expecting to get them to go to more non-native trees because the population has been stable in a very unstable habitat. So I thought they might just supplement their diet with some mangoes, which they seem to be doing, but not to the extent that I was thinking they were doing. Can I uh, just say something? How many of those non-native trees are found above 200 meters or so? Because from my memory, the bats tend not to come much below 200 meters so if you're the bulk of your non-native trees other than the things like the kapok are low down then that's why you're not finding them using them that's a very good point will it was it's so good that you're here um <laughs> it's really good to see you i was i'm surprised but thank you for showing up um it's a very very good point i'm going to look at this obviously in more detail once we have more trees and surveys done um what we did find that there's a couple of bats that do go down to nearly sea level for explorative searches, explorative flights, which I thought was interesting. Great. Um, we have another question from Emmanuel. Um, comment just saying that really impressive uh, and intense fieldwork. Um, asking about, um, aside from habitat type, do you think or do you know if the bats prefer specific tree characteristics, um, such as local tree abundance or distance to roosts? Um, maybe that would be relevant to for strategies for refilling of the trees? I, there's something I honestly, once I have a data set, I'm going to play around with it and look at it more. At this point, I couldn't be able to give you a satisfactory answer because for me right now, it's a bit like looking at Anjuan and everything's green and you have to kind of start looking closer to see which what's actually happening. So at this point, I'm just overwhelmed with data and I'm really happy that I'm getting anything. Uh, but ask me again in a year. Great, we'll have you back for another webinar in a year then. <laughs> um, we still have some time, so I'm going to keep asking questions because there's lots of questions and comments in the chat. Um, Abhijat asked about um, whether or not bats try fruits that they haven't eaten before. Does that mean they will readily eat non-native fruits? That is so an excellent question, honestly. Um, I hadn't thought about this. Knowing from captivity, from the, there's uh, at least one, I think there's two now, groups of Livingston's fruit bats in captivities in zoos in the UK. And I mean, those are spoiled bats, you know, they get fed um, fruit and pellets and, you know, but they do use their sense of smell a lot before biting into something. So I can imagine that bats and flying foxes in particular, they will seek out something that potentially smells like food to them and they might try it, but they, they rely very much on, on smelling the fruit first. And 
I think there's there's a lot of preference, also individual preference and in what they eat and maybe what they learn from their parents as well. So it could be that it's just being handed, that knowledge is being handed down from mothers to, to pups that, you know, eat these fruits, maybe don't try this fruit. But honestly, that is a very good question. I'm going to look that up after this talk. I, I actually had a similar question to that. Um, and it's, so you told us about the what, where and when uh, the bats are going. But do we know or have you got any uh, more research planned in terms of finding out what the bats are actually doing in those in those landscapes, what they're feeding on uh, and what their ecological role is in these landscapes? I'm just thinking about the implications for, um, you talked about incentives for land managers and farmers, for example, so whether or not we can tell them a bit more, more about what the bats are doing for them. Uh, the bats, uh, the, the, the people know, like they entirely, they know that the bats are important. Um, the people don't have an alternative to, to cutting down the forest, but they know the bats are important and they're here for the forest. So there's not much new, I can tell them. But we are looking at um, fecal samples as well to kind of just see what kind of seeds they might pass through the, the feces. But it is very limited work at this point because it's very been very hard to get fecal samples. A lot of the roosts are on very steep slopes. So trying to get um like covers on the roosts and catch fecal samples has been very difficult if you have them in the hand you know we don't catch that many we can get the few fecal samples but it's not a lot so there's a there's some aspects or some limitations of this field work that um have been a bit surprising i was hoping we could do more but we're trying to combine the knowledge we gain through the gps tracks the trees and the areas they visit and revisit and the fecal samples, we're trying to paint a more complete picture of what they might be eating where and where they might be dispersing seeds um, across the landscape. But I can't promise anything. Again, if it's one of these things unsatisfactory, I'll tell you in a year. Great. Um, just some final questions. They're all about GPS trackers. Um, so have you found them to be reliable or have you had any issues with equipment uh, failure? Not failure as such, but they do. So I found this particular model to be quite reliable. However, they rely on a lot of good sunshine to recharge sufficiently. And as you've seen with my photos, maybe that there's a lot of cloud cover. Even if it's not raining, it's very cloudy a lot of the time. So the few there's a few trackers that have been recharging amazingly. And there is a couple of trackers that just never recharged after about a month. So we know where the bat is or where the tracker has dropped. We just can't, we know that, that there's no charge on the tracker. Um, so there's not necessarily failure as such that just has limitations um, and it very much depends on where you work, what kind of GPS tracker you want to use and kind of try and assess what is feasible um, financially, but also, you know, do you have to get the tracker back? Do you, can you download the data remotely? How big is your animal? So those are the sort of things you should probably think about um, beforehand. Okay, I'll just ask one final question from the chat. Um, are you going to be using the GPS trackers um, on the other species of bats and see if they correlate uh, uh, in terms would, of flight paths? That would be fun because I have my suspicions that they don't correlate that much. Um, like Will mentioned earlier, the Livingston's fruit bats, they are very much found in the higher elevations and the Seychelles flying fox tend to be in the lower elevations. So there seem to be not that much of an overlap in many of the areas. There are some areas where they definitely overlap, but in the very high elevations, you find only mainly Livingston's fruit bats. So I think there would be some interesting um, data to be gained from tagging the other species, but I'm not planning on doing it because it is very cost and labor intensive to track and um, track bats, catch bats. And it's not if it's not 100% necessary for conservation, in my opinion, I don't really want to be doing it. Great. Well, I think I'll, I'll stop there. There's lots of comments uh, and just saying great talk and, and really uh, interesting and exciting research. Um, so thank you very much again, uh, Isabella, for joining us today and, and telling us about the fruit bats. Uh, it's really enjoyable. Um, and um, everyone else, thank you for joining us also, and please try and join us for the upcoming webinars uh, in our series, and enjoy the rest of your afternoons. Thank you so much. Thank you.